all of that to joke around a bit. Um, if you haven't noticed, my computer's not working. Are you guys good back there? Okay. Nope. You guys can all look on the back screen. It works just fine. Try this one more time. You know, I figured Rodney would leave. Okay, there that is. We'll just go with it. Everybody needs to thank the tech guys when they see them after the morning service. Without them, this would all go horribly wrong. But it's kind of interesting when you have to preach once every once in a while. Because you have the whole Bible to say, okay, what's the one thing that God wants me to talk to you about this morning? And then not talk to you guys for a long time after that. And it's always interesting. Um, Pastor Ronnie has mentioned it with the way Dan leads, that he never tells them what his theme is, but somehow the Spirit works in such a way as to direct everything into a common theme. And so if you guys missed it, all those songs seem to be pointing to what the whole point of this message will be this morning, and that is direction. God is leading us all in a certain direction. And so my question for us this morning is, where is Christ leading you? Journey. We're all in a certain pathway and Christ is getting us to a certain meeting point. So it kind of helped get the juices flowing a little bit. When we go on a car trip, what, what do you typically do first thing? You plan it out, right? How, how many type A people do we have in this room? Just show of hands. So you're one of the people that two years from now, you are going to sit down, you're going to pull out the atlas, maybe Google Maps, depending on your age range, uh, and you're going to plan this thing out. This is where we're stopping. This is the road that we're taking. We're taking it right here. All those things go so well in your planning, and you just figure, hey, it's going to work out. Then what's the next step into your trip? You just enjoy the ride, right? I mean, everything's going to go perfectly smooth. I mean, what's the worst thing that could happen? I mean, detours, those aren't so bad. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? I mean, you, have, you still have your timetable, you're still only a few minutes off, and then road closed. Uh, when we were on vacation, we were leaving from Vermont to arrive at a church that Julie and I were a part of in college, and we had a time perfectly. We we're going to arrive half an hour early. We were going to be perfectly fine. 30 minutes outside of the last portion of our trip, we come across a road closed. So I quickly do the Google map, finally the next closest direction. It would get us there like two minutes before the service would start. I mean, what else could happen? And this is probably my favorite one, is you are driving along the road and there's the guy with the sign who knows you can't drive. So he has to point and direct you into the way that you have to go. But, I mean, we all know that at some point along our trip, along the direction of life, in a car ride, something's going to come where you're not expecting. There's going to be a detour. There's going to be a road closed. There's going to be somebody with a sign that says stop, yield, all those different things. All those things can occur within our lives. And so I thought this was very pertinent for us to understand that these things that happen in our mundane driving life happens in our spiritual lives probably more than we realize. What we plan to be a smooth ride in the car, God sometimes has different plans. Sometimes our preconceived ideas are not what God's preconceived ideas for us are. And so this morning, uh, we're going to be turning to Luke chapter 9. Uh, if you have a chair Bible there, it's going to be page 866. But Luke chapter 9. And I'm going to do something a little bit different. Normally, you know, a preacher comes up here, he has one verse that he spends 50 minutes on. I have about 62 verses that I'm going to spend. No. 
I am going to read the whole chapter, so stay with me through that. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a large gl- glance at this chapter. And then we're going to narrow it down into a single passage. Because oftentimes in our culture, we get the idea that the Bible is just neat little chunks. Uh, those little subheadings within the chapters we feel are the authorized portions of Scripture. Those are just there to help us. Sometimes we miss the big picture of what's trying to be communicated to us. So we're going to read the entire chapter 9, starting in verse 1. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he cast them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And whenever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now Herod, Herod, the Tetrarch, heard about all that was happening. He was perplexed because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. But Herod said, John I beheaded, but who is this about whom I heard such things? And he sought to see him. Now on their return, the apostles told him all that they had done, and he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowd learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away and go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fishes unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and set before the crowd, and they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, twelve baskets of broken pieces. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with them, and he asked them, Who do the crowd say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. Others say, Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. And he strictly charged them and commanded them to tell that this to no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed on the third day, be raised. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with them. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he was saying. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son. My chosen one, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. 
And the next day, when they came down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out. They not. Jesus answered, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. But while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they didn't understand the saying, and it was concerning they may not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this saying. And an argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child put him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. John answered, Master, we saw demons in your name and he tried to stop them because he did not follow us. But Jesus said to him, do not stop or the one who is not against you is for you. When the day drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered the village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said to him, Lord, do you want us to cast fire down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. And they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And so, throughout this entire chapter, we're going to take our first glance. And in our first glance, we're going to see one common theme throughout it. And that is this. Jesus is calling us to follow his course for our lives. Sometimes we kind of miss the timetable of things that are going on within uh, the biography of Jesus. But in this point, Jesus has been about 18 months with his disciples. He's been ministering for about 18 months. And Jesus is leading his disciples up to a point. And that point was, after my death, you guys are going to take up the ministry that I've been doing, and you are going to go out and proclaim the kingdom of God. And so I'm leading you men to this breaking point. And so as that is true of the disciples' lives, Jesus is doing that exact same thing in our lives today. He is calling us to follow a course for our lives. He is breaking us to a point in which he is going to say, all right, Ryan, now it's your turn. I have poured into your life. Now is your turn to pour out into others. So at first glance, we're going to just kind of, I'm going to give you a little breakdown of each portion of the verses that Jesus is leading them through. Uh, in the first six verses, we see that Jesus commissions the disciples. Uh, this is the first time that Jesus says, all right, you men, you're going to go out. And what does he do? He gives them the power to cast out demons, to heal, and to proclaim the kingdom of God. And then from that point, Jesus demonstrates his provision in the feeding of the 5,000. But what's interesting here is the text tells us about 5,000. But men, let's be honest. Would you ever get away with getting a free meal? without your significant other? I'd get deeply in trouble. I'd come home like, yeah, honey, Jesus had all these fishes and breads and he fed us all. You did what? 
you went out and ate lunch without me? So uh, it says 5,000, but some estimations with wives and children that this could be anywhere from 10,000 to 25,000 people. Regardless of whatever the number is, Jesus fed them with a few loaves and a few fish. And in this, Jesus demonstrates for their course of their life that no matter what, I will provide for you through it all. Then the next set of verses, 18 through 20, Jesus' disciples identify him. Uh, a few verses earlier, we see Herod ask the question, who is this man that does these great things? But Jesus understood one something better for his disciples, that they need to understand who he truly was. So he asked the question, who do you say that I am? And Peter, of course, it only had to be Peter, would speak up and say, Jesus, you're the Messiah. You're the King. You're the Christ. You are God. Then we move on to Jesus' plan in verse 21 through 22. And this is where Jesus tells his disciples, I'm going to die. I know what you guys are thinking. I know what you guys want. You want me to set up an earthly kingdom. You want me to overthrow the Roman occupancy that is here. But that's not my plan. That's your plan, but that's not my plan for you. I have a greater plan. Then the next set of verses, 23 through 27, Jesus explains what a true disciple is. He says that if anybody wants to be a true disciple of mine, he must take up his cross and follow me. And what Jesus was basically saying here is that you must accept all the ridicule, all the slander, all the wrongdoing that is going to come to you. But remember, I commissioned you. Remember, I provided for you. Remember that I am God. If you want to be a true disciple of mine, you must follow me and trust me. The next set of verses, Jesus glory is shown on the Mount Transfiguration. And I kind of find this miraculous because uh, I love that little portion where, you know, I love how the Bible's honest. And here you have the three disciples who see Jesus in his glory, see Moses and Elijah, and Peter says, hey, let's make three tents. And I love how the Bible is very honest here because Luke was the one who wrote this, but he was probably hearing it from Peter. And Peter said, this is what happened. This is what I said. I had no idea what I was saying. It seemed like the right thing at the time. And I, and I read that, and I think of many times where I'm in a situation, I had no idea what I say. I say something, I'm like, stupid, stupid, stupid. And here's Peter. That was stupid. I don't know why I said it, but I said it. And the Bible is just very honest about that. Next set of verses, uh, Jesus' power over demons. And this, to me, I don't know, I've never seen a demon cast out of somebody. I don't know if you have. Probably not. But here's this situation where there's this demon-possessed boy. Nine of his disciples couldn't do anything about it. Here comes Jesus and says, get out. And he obeys. Then after this moment, Jesus reiterates his plan to his disciples. He says, remember what I told you earlier, that I'm going to die? I'm reminding you again that I am going to die let this sink into your ears. Then, verse 46 through 48, Jesus teaches about greatness. I think this would be very humbling for fishermen. I'm not a fisherman, but when I think of a fisherman, I think of a big burly guy who's able to do a lot of great things. And what does Jesus do to teach them? He grabs a lowly child who may be able to re- re- reel in maybe a trout, if that, these guys are able to bring in nets full of fishes. And he says, if you guys want to be great, you need to be like this child. What is a child? A child is humble to some degree. A child is weak. If you want to be great, you need to be like one of these. Then verses 49 through 50, Jesus' work goes beyond our circle of influence. And I think this is kind of miraculous because here... John sees a man who casts out a demon and he says, Lord, he casts out a demon. He's not following us. And we try to stop him. But Jesus, what does Jesus say? Jesus says, you know what? My circle of influence, my circle of power goes beyond just your small circle. It goes beyond the 12. I'm doing things beyond what you can comprehend at this point. And then verse 51 through 56, 
uh, Jesus' plans are greater than ours. And this is kind of interesting. And I know to some degree some of us might think along this nature. Uh, you have somebody that you don't like, and, you, and Jesus has given you power. And James and John says, Lord, do you want us to cast fire down on them, to wipe them out, to kill them? But what they didn't understand that Jesus' plans was to never stop in Samaria. And so he says, my plans are greater than yours. My plans go beyond your plans. And then lastly, Jesus demonstrates the cost of following him. He has these three gentlemen who want to be followers of his, but the text makes it seem like they had good intentions. But if you were to study that a little bit deeper, which we won't have time today, but if you were to study that a little bit deeper, the man who says, I need to go bury my father, uh, you would understand that he wasn't saying that my father's dead. He's saying that when my father dies and I inherit my inheritance, I will follow you. And the other man who says, I will follow you, just let me go say goodbye to my family. It's the same situation. So Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you can't be held back by past experiences. You can't be held back by anything. You must follow me wholeheartedly. And that goes again back to taking up your cross and following me. But this entire chapter is summarizing one main point. Christ was leading them to a breaking point. Christ was leading them to a destination. And through each one of these encounters throughout this chapter, Jesus is saying, I am equipping you for the work of the ministry. I am equipping you to trust me, to know me better. So that's our first glance. And then our second glance, or our closer inspection we're going to kind of hone in on verses 37 to 46. After the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus, Peter, James, and John are coming down off the mountain. And it says, On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him, so he foams at the mouth and shatters him and would hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. I find this really interesting. Because what did Jesus just do earlier in the first portion of the chapter? He gave them power to cast out demons. And yet, here are nine of his disciples, and not one of them's able to do it? What happened? Did did Jesus' power leave them? No. What I think happened, and if we were to compare Matthew and Mark to this account, we see two things that happened in this account. We see, one, the disciples didn't have enough faith to do it. It says that they were of little faith. But Jesus also says that this type of demon can only be cast out by prayer. So what I think happened in the first portion happened. They were able to cast out demons. It worked really well. But what happens in our lives when success happens? When God calls us to do something great and we receive success? Well, second time comes around. Well, I did it the first time. I can do it the second time really well, right? We become overconfident in our own power, in our own strength, and so we try to carry it all out by ourselves. And that's what happened to the disciples. So Jesus targets them with this accusation. O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and to bear with you This was an indictment against his own apostles, his own disciples saying, how long? 18 months I've been with you. I only have about 18 more months with you. How long is it going to take you to understand this lesson? See, there's two problems upon closer inspection. The first problem was the disciples' perspective. See, up until this point, the disciples would have been taught by the Pharisees and religious leaders that when the Messiah comes, when this reign of the Messiah would happen, he will usurp the Roman authority that is over us, and he will reign and we will be set up as a major power once again. 
And so when Jesus shows up on the scene, 18 months of being with him, you would imagine casting out demons, healing the sick, providing for them in miraculous ways, walking on water, all these miraculous things happened. They would start thinking, all right, the Messiah is here. He's doing everything that we've been taught about from the Old Testament. This is finally the moment that we've been waiting for. 18 months. Could you imagine what it would have been like to see Jesus work for 18 months? See, their preconceived ideas were polluting where Jesus was leading them. All these ideas that they were taught, Jesus was trying to be countercultural to those things. Uh, we went to the book of John in chapter 20. John tells us that if we were to record everything that Jesus has done, there's not enough pen and ink in the world and paper to record everything. 18 months. So you'd imagine there would be some confusion when Jesus shows up in this chapter saying, I'm going to die. What? No, 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 no. See, Jesus, you, you came, and we know that from the Old Testament that you're going to set up the kingdom and that we're going to be your right-hand men and that this is going to be a sweet time. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. Wouldn't you be confused? All your life you've been raised to be taught a certain thing about who Jesus is or the Messiah and what he was going to do. Here comes the Messiah and he's doing everything that he's supposed to do except he's telling you he's going to die? There'd be major confusion. But you see, Jesus' direction for his disciples' lives was different than their thoughts. How much is that true of us? Maybe you came to faith in Christ at a young age, or maybe you just come to faith in Christ recently. We have preconceived ideas of what Jesus wants. You listen to some preachers on TV, and their thoughts of Jesus is that he will make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. Let me tell you very quickly, Jesus will quickly change your mind in that regard. That is not Jesus' course for our lives. Jesus' course for our lives is that of maturity in him in faith. So upon closer inspection, we actually see what Jesus' direction is in this chapter. You see, Jesus knew where he was coming from. Uh, John 8, 14 says that I bear witness about myself. I know where I come from and I know where I'm going. Jesus knew that he was God. And Jesus knew that he was going to die and be raised again on the third day and ascended to the Father on high. Verse 22 and verse 44 give clear direction to that. Jesus says, I'm going to be delivered over to the religious leaders and I'm going to die. Despite what you think the Messiah is going to do, this is what I'm actually going to do because this is plan A. When I die, I will set people free from their sin because Jesus knew that was the only way to bring salvation to us. Jesus understood the plan. Jesus knew the course of direction. And he was trying to get his hard-headed disciples to understand, this is the way to go, follow me. So when he gives this vexation in verse 41, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? I could understand frustration. Imagine pouring your life into a group of people for 18 months, teaching them, growing them, helping them understand and they fail over and over and over again. That'd be frustrating. That'd be hard. But Jesus, over and over again, was seeking to remove distractions. Uh, whether it was Peter, when Jesus said, I'm going to die, and Peter says to him, Lord, that will never happen. What does Jesus do? He says, Peter, you're acting like Satan. Get behind me. When Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, he removes those distractions from Satan because plan A is the cross. 
Plan A is to die. This is the direction. This is the course that I am heading. Jesus casts out the demon in verse 42. He was coming. The demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, gave him back to his father, and all were astonished at the majesty of God. But while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, let these words sink into your head. I want you to get this. I'm going to die. I am not setting up this kingdom. Get rid of those preconceived ideas of what you think your life is going to be like because that's not the direction I am taking you. The direction I'm going to take you is to become more like myself. Ridicule, hardship, I want you guys to get this. And the disciples' lives are filled with highs and lows. I mean, if you read about it, I always find it miraculous. Um, you know, the, the 12 go, they cast out all the demons, they come back, give Jesus a report, and says, man, this is great. But then what happens? They miss the point. They miss the point of the lesson. And then the Mount of Transfiguration happens. This is great. Um, all these things are going on. Then what happens? The nine fail at casting out a demon, so they're back down in the valley. And then Jesus casts out the demons. They're back up on the high. Jesus tells them, I'm going to die. And what does verse 45 say? But they did not understand this saying, and it was concealed from them so that they may not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. You know what this tells me? This tells me that the disciples are actually a mirror of you and I. If you really think about it, um, let's go with Thomas. Doubting Thomas. Everybody knows Doubting Thomas. I struggle with doubt at times. I miss the point of the lesson of the faith that Jesus is trying to take me through. Uh, I'm like Peter sometimes. Foot and mouth more often than I probably want to admit. I'm like James and John. Lord, cast down fire. Kill these people. I'm sick of them. You're laughing because you know it's true. (laughs) But you know what? I'm just really glad that only disciples were really hard-headed and never understood the lessons Jesus was taking them through because that would be really tough if that was your life, right? Oh, wait. (laughs) That is our life. (laughs) But Jesus, in his mercy and grace towards them, what does he do? He says... I love you guys no matter what. I care enough that even though you guys don't understand the saying that I'm telling to you right now, I'm still going to love you guys and I'm going to only reveal so much truth to you right now. But later on, when my Holy Spirit comes on you and acts, that is when all this is really going to kind of make sense for you. And that's what Jesus does for us at times. He says, you may not understand this situation, this direction that we're going in, but one day you will. One day you're going to understand why this hardship is in your life. But one thing I do promise you is that I will be with you through it. I will love you through it. But after all this, what happens? What do disciples do? They get this hard saying that they didn't understand. What happens next? They argue about who is the greatest. They miss the point. Mount of Transfiguration, demon cast out. This is amazing. We're marveling at Jesus. Peter, I'm better than you. John, all your silly nonsense about love, forget that. I'm going to be at Jesus' right hand. I have all the money. Thomas, you're an idiot. You're always doubting. Why don't you get this? They're arguing about who is the greatest. And you see, this is why we are just like the disciples. We have highs and we miss the point and then we go right back to our old foolish ways. Uh, Let me just make these couple of points. See, like the disciples, we reach spiritual highs and want to stop and make camp like Peter on the mountain. We have victories and start trusting in our own power, but when we're faced with a difficult situation, we wonder why we fail like the nine with the demon. We come across a situation where God tells us something and we never want to step out and ask questions because we do not want to look dumb just as the disciples did when Jesus says, I'm going to die. We're just like them. 
But you know what? There's good news. Because Jesus never gave up on them. Jesus knew that when he died, they were going to abandon him and run away. And Jesus never gave up on them. And Jesus will never give up on you. Jesus is leading us to a certain direction. And so we come to this point where we have a choice. Am I going to follow my way? Am I going to view my perspective? Am I going to continue along my preconceived ideas of who Jesus is? Or am I going to trust God and go the way that he wants me to go? You see, before the crown could come for Jesus, the cross had to come. Before the royal diadem was placed on his head, he had to receive the thorn, the crown of thorns. So the next steps for us, what direction is God calling you to? I think we're all honest to some degree. We know God is calling us to something. But whether we want to step out in faith and follow that direction is really where we're stuck. What direction is God calling you towards? Maybe it's giving up something. Or maybe it's accepting a responsibility that he has for your life. See, when God called Julie and myself here to Panama, we knew that this was where God was calling us. And we knew we only had one course of action, to step out in obedience. So where is God calling you this morning? What in your life needs to be put to death? As Jesus says in verse 23, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. What needs to be put to death in your life so that you can follow Jesus in the direction that he is calling you to? Because God's desire for you is to be more like Jesus Christ. As Paul says in Philippians, I count everything in my past as rubbish in comparison to knowing who Jesus Christ is. I press on towards the goal of Christ's likeness. And so for us this morning... Uh, One way that we can do this, as Pastor Rodney has been talking about, is living out the spiritual disciplines. Uh, And and in case you forgot what some of those were, uh, Pastor Rodney has been talking about death of life, simplicity, silence and solitude, surrender, prayer, humility, self-control. Living those spiritual disciplines out will help you in your direction towards Christ-likeness. What direction is God calling you to? You know what? For some of us here this morning, it might be stepping out by faith, donating something, volunteering for something. Or maybe for some of us, it might be our first step or direction towards God and what he's calling us to is salvation. Whatever direction that is, you will never be happy until you follow God in obedience in that course. So this week would be really good for us if we could just examine our lives and say, what is it that I need to put to death so that I can follow the course of direction God has for my life? And let me tell you, God will show it to you if you truly want to find out. Let's pray. Father God, I just want to thank you for today. I want to thank you for this opportunity that you have given to us. Father, thank you that you love us and care for us deeply, that you desire for us a better course for this life. Father, I just ask that you would reveal to us our need of Christ and that you would show us where it is that you're calling us to. Father, I just pray that we would have a deeper sense of who you are and a deeper love for you because of all this. I just pray this in your son's holy name. Amen.